Hello and welcome. My name is Amanda Granger. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the WNET Group, the home of Channel 13, America's flagship PBS station. On behalf of our CEO, Neil Shapiro, and all of our colleagues at the WNET Group, I thank you for joining us for our new town hall series, Exploring Hate Presents. Tonight is the second of three conversations focusing on conspiracy theories that never die, racist scapegoating throughout history, and the disinformation that threatens our democracy. As always, our focus is on strategies and solidarity with an understanding of history and eyes toward the future. These forums are part of exploring hate, anti-Semitism, racism, and extremism. This new public media initiative from the WNET Group investigates the roots and rise of hate in America and across the globe. Reporting for Exploring Hate is done in partnership with the WNET Group's local and national broadcast programs, including Amanpour and Company, PBS NewsHour Weekend, Metro Focus, NJ Spotlight News, and WGBH's Frontline. Exploring Hate is developing original documentary productions and digital content, PBS learning media educational tools for classrooms, and community engagement events like the one you're attending tonight. The WNET Group is committed to producing responsible journalism, fostering respectful discussions, and airing diverse points of view. That work is only made possible through your support, including our donors who generously contribute to our newly launched funds for news and public affairs and diversity, equity, and inclusion. With your help, we will continue to find relevant and useful ways to serve and inform our nation, our community, and the next generation of public media audiences. Tonight's town hall is titled The Truth of the Matter, Grievance, Greed, and Conspiracy Theories. We will have time for an audience Q&A, so as you watch the live stream, please share your questions in the comment section. Please also join us next Thursday for the final conversation in this series, Disrupting Deceit, Exposing and Opposing Disinformation Campaigns. Learn more at pbs.org slash exploring hate. I'd like to thank our partners for tonight's town hall. We're grateful for the support of the American, the, sorry, the Asian American Writers Workshop, Baji, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Black Women's Blueprint, the New York chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, JFREJ, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, Latino Justice, PRLDEF, and the New York Immigration Council. Thank you also to our ASL interpreters for tonight, Talisi Haynes and Ali Foley. A quick reminder that the views expressed tonight are those of the panelists and do not necessarily reflect those of the WNET Group, PBS, or Exploring Hate. And now I'm pleased to introduce WNET's Community Partnership Specialist and also the curator and moderator of tonight's program, Brian Tate. Thank you so much, Amanda, and greetings, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here. I wanna begin by acknowledging and paying deep respect to the Lenape people, upon whose unceded ancestral homeland lies the city we call Manhattan. I invite you to join me in this acknowledgement and a spirit of humility and solidarity with a commitment to decolonization and racial justice. I want to also acknowledge the continuity between our meeting here today and the collective struggle for liberation and the full expression of our humanity that, that has transcended generations. Countless lives have been lost in this struggle and we hold all those people close. We are thankful for their lives and we honor them as we gather to speak truth and create change. I'd like to now thank all of you for joining us for week two of the Exploring Hate Presents Town Halls. We kicked off last week with a powerful program called Set the World on Fire, How Anti-Semitism Fuels White Nationalism. If you missed it, that program can be viewed at our website, pbs.org slash exploring hate. And next Thursday, we wrap up with Disrupting Deceit, Exposing and Opposing Disinformation Campaigns. Tonight's program is called The Truth of the Matter, Grievance, Greed, and Conspiracy Theories. Please join me now in welcoming our incredible panelists. They are Hasia R. Diner, Paul and Sylvia Steinberg, Professor of American Jewish History at NYU and the author, author of several books, including How America Met the Jews. Hasia, wonderful to have you here. Shannon Hodge, producer at CNN and the producer of CNN's Refocusing History series. Shannon, great to have you. Dahlia Magahead, 
Director of Research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, Dahlia. Monica Munez Martinez, Associate Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin, and the author of the book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, Anti-Mexican Violence in Texas. And last, Helen Zia, activist, journalist, and author whose books include Asian American Dreams, The Emergence of an American People. Thank you all so much for being here and happy birthday to Hasia. <laughs> we'll be taking questions from the audience tonight, but first to help create a backdrop to tonight's talk, a few questions for everyone watching. How are cynical claims of stolen elections and of global plots to control the United States linked to conspiracy, linked to conspiracy theories that white supremacists have advanced throughout history to justify plunder and violence? What ties those older deceits to the orchestrated assaults on equality that now unfold in plain sight? The, dec the decimation of voting rights and civil liberties, the armed revolts at state houses, the insurrection at the US Capitol. Those are among the topics we'll be discussing tonight as well as strategies for advancing democracy and solidarity in the face of hate. Panelists, uh, Please help us understand the scale and complexity of this problem by putting it in historical context. Hasia and Helen, I'd like to start with you. We've lately seen an uptick in hateful rhetoric and physical violence against Jewish Americans and Asian Americans, attacks that question the notion that members of those communities are accepted as Americans, but the rhetoric and fear mongering are nothing new. Hasia, in 1919, American automobile manufacturer Henry Ford used print media to spread loud, poisonous falsehoods about Jews. In the 1930s, the popular radio priest, Father Charles Edward Coughlin, used the airwaves to mount similar attacks. To what extent did their comments reflect or intensify the anti-Semitism of the day, and what impact did they have? In time, or a lot back in time. It's notable that the arguments that Ford used, that the arguments that Coughlin used, the arguments that we hear today are, uh, one might say, boringly familiar. And I say boringly not because they're not, they're not toxic, but they are repetitions of lies that have been heard for uh, uh, um, since really the early Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, the question of, you know, what, well, what, what are those lies? And they're about Jewish control of society, usually surreptitious and behind the scenes, the uh, inordinate uh, uh, power of Jews to control uh, the money supply, the threat of the Jews to Christianity and to uh, the uh, real people who uh, uh, belong in the place. Uh, threat lies about uh, Jewish uh, uh, poisoning of the uh, physical bodily health of the uh, uh, other people in the society. So uh, Ford and Coughlin didn't spring out of uh, nowhere. Uh, their impact uh, was, uh, we might say, powerful in as much as uh, those two in particular uh, offered uh, their lies, uh, made their conspiracy uh, theories, uh, at moments really fraught in American public policy. And so Ford is on the scene as the nation is debating uh, the nature of uh, immigration. Uh, Jews were an immigrant people. Uh, they were coming in the hundreds of thousands uh, from uh, very difficult circumstances, particularly in Eastern Europe and uh, in an America that was very concerned about how many people can we uh, let in and what kind of people can we let in. Uh, the rhetoric of Ford uh, flowed very nicely into an idea that uh, Jews should be among the uh, uh, um, excluded, although they were never excluded by name, which is actually very, very important and tells us a little bit about American policy. Coughlin, on the other hand, is he, he turns on the Jews in 1938, uh, almost simultaneous uh, with the real uh, turn in uh, German policy, not that it wasn't horrible 
uh, starting in 1933, but 1938, uh, the, Pol the uh, uh, German invasion of, uh, or entry into Austria and the uh, mass slaughter of the Jews of Vienna, Kristallnacht, uh, uh, the uh, desperation of the Jews uh, in uh, Germany, Austria, parts of Czechoslovakia, their desperation to leave. Okay, and in a uh, very, un unfortunately, it was a very small debate because the Amer U.S. policy was not swerving. Um, Coughlin's ideas certainly had an impact in uh, pushing or muting any chance uh, that the United States would in any way modify its uh, iron gates uh, mm. and uh, not change the immigration laws. So uh, we can't lay the Holocaust at the feet of Father Coughlin, but certainly the behavior of the United States was not disconnected from the uh, poisonous words which reached uh, millions and millions of uh, Americans. So um, these two individuals that you cited uh, join in a long line of um, conspiracy mongers, of uh, uh, purveyors of lies against the Jews. And that's always the tip off was when they talked about the Jews. Uh, and that was the tip off that what they were talking about in the guise of fact were, were indeed uh, lies. And uh, that uh, Jews had no legitimate place uh, in America. But again, it was true in uh, all of the other places where these kinds of ideas uh, uh, pervaded and abounded. Got it. Thank you, Hasia. Helen, uh, I'd like to ask if you would please connect the dots for us between the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. President Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066 that directed the unjust incarceration of tens of thousands of Japanese Americans in 1942, and the killing of Vincent Chin, a Chinese American who was beaten to death in a racist attack in Detroit, Michigan in 1982. Can you tell us how those events are connected by the economics of racial resentment and the enforced absence of knowledge that you have called MIH missing in history. Absolutely, thank you, Brian. And, um, and certainly the, the kind of isolation, scapegoating, um, creation of these hateful, uh, you know, uh, perceptions of Asian Americans uh, is parallel to what we just heard from Hasia and how uh, Jews have been isolated and identified and vilified that's something that happened to Asian Americans throughout uh, American history. And you started out with the 1882 um, Chinese Exclusion Act, which was the first time in American history that a, a, a group was singled out by a US law to be excluded from um, the shores of America. And, um, but I have to say that was actually preceded by a long period of, of um, mass meetings all across the West Coast, what was an ethnic cleansing period to try to get rid of all the Chinese. And the actual first law came at, about in 1875, you know, um, seven years before the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was the Page Act. And that was directed against Chinese women, saying mm -hmm. that they were, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, bringing immorality, that they were uh, uh, bringing disease, that they were going to harm America. So this was directed against women and Chinese women in particular, which really came to um, to people to be reminded of when the mass killings in Atlanta uh, occurred earlier this year. But so the Exclusion Act basically said that all people who were of Chinese background were just they were like rats, they ate rats, they were uh, vermin, they were uh, disgusting, they were immoral, they were subhuman and should not be allowed in the U.S. because they would help bring about the demise of the U.S. And, and I know from our other speakers, we're going to hear parallel things that were said about uh, pretty much everybody who, and the groups um, that we um, represent on this panel. But so that was carried forward. But the thing about the Chinese Exclusion Act, it, it said Chinese could not be 
admitted they could never become citizens of the United States, which also meant that they could not ever vote, they could not run for office, they could not own property, all of these things. And if any American citizen woman would marry a Chinese, they would lose their citizenships. So all of these things were packed in to the Chinese Exclusion Act and then were extended to every other Asian ethnicity over time. And groups fought this, fought this very hard. There was a lot of resistance. Um, one of the people who actually fought this Chinese Exclusion Act uh, was born in the US. His name was Wang Kim Ark. He fought this exclusion all the way to the Supreme Court. And his decision in 1898 by the Supreme Court uh, set into law in the US that anybody born in the US would be an American citizen. So actually the resistance of Chinese um, to the exclusion was something that then that resistance benefited every, Amer every American of immigrant or refugee background because their children would have birthright American citizenship. So fast forward, every Asian group is identified as being not eligible for citizenship, can't own property, can't run for office, can't do any of these things. Um, many of them could not, women were excluded. So they became bachelor societies and the Chinese and other communities sh shrank in numbers. And then we have World War II and you brought up the internment of, of Japanese Americans. So um, here by 1942, we have uh, you know, a group of Japanese Americans that included American born children. And when World War II breaks out, there are all kinds of um, things that appear, for example, in, in Time Magazine that have pictures of Japanese Americans. And it's, it's like how to tell uh, that an Asian is a J word and that um, they are evil, they are enemies, they can't be trusted, they are spies. And so then every Japanese American on the west coast of America is rounded up and put into um, uh, prison camps in the middle of nowhere, uh, internment camps they were called, or actually at the time they were called concentration camps to put all of these Japanese Americans, many of whom were born here and had no connection to Japan at all. But the idea that every Asian was untrustworthy, an enemy invader in our presence, that was, um, you know, had its seeds in the 1800s with Chinese, but you know, one of the things that every Asian in America has been told is we all look alike, we're all the same, and nothing could be further from the truth. And then in, 1980, in 1982, in the middle of an economic downturn, a depression during the Reagan years, it was just the elimination of every safety net that existed in America, um, I was an auto worker in Detroit at the time. Every everybody in auto, every worker was just you know out of work because people weren't buying American cars. And um, just as Hussey was talking about the vilification of Jews in America at the time, they all sort of went around blaming each other until finally they put the finger on Japan. It's their fault. It's because Japanese make fuel efficient cars that the American auto industry collapsed. Germany also made fuel efficient cars that people were buying, but racism doesn't work unless people look different. So anybody who looked Japanese was under attack. And it was in that climate that a young Chinese American man was beaten to death by two white auto workers. Um, and they said, it's because of you mother Fs that we're out of work. And to make matters worse, the judge who was sentencing those killers said, hey, probation, they should get probation because, you know, these aren't the kind of men you send to jail. Uh, and it was basically giving a license to kill any Asian American uh, in a climate of economic um, distress. And here we are today at the present, you know, the pandemic of uh, coronavirus. And as soon as that was identified in Wuhan, China, the harassment, the attacks began. And we know that not only are people hurting from a disease, a pandemic, but also there's a global economic crisis and now a pandemic of hate, a pandemic of hate that's you know been unleashed against many groups 
and Asian Americans have been facing it just a, a terrible time. One group that's been collecting data during this period um, has had more than 9,000 reports so far of harassment, bullying, hate, and some of them have led to deaths, uh, especially of our most vulnerable, you know, the elderly who just are going out for a walk and being um, uh, harassed and killed, unfortunately. And uh, the mass killings in Atlanta, followed by another mass killing um, less than two weeks later in Indianapolis against South Asian uh, Sikh Americans. So this tying to catastrophes, um, economic distress, there's always this, you know, the, those in power want to find somebody else to blame. And they mm. scapegoat groups and try to set us against each other. And, uh, and that's one way to take the pressure off. Helen, thank you so much for that. I want to also ask you uh, just a quick follow-up. Uh, when the tens of thousands of Japanese Americans were incarcerated as a result of that presidential order, what became of their homes? What became of their businesses? What became of their, of their life savings and et cetera? So there was a sort of a, a subtext there too. The, you know, some of these Japanese Americans, you know, they couldn't own land because of the um, uh, different exclusion acts. And they found ways when they had American born children to then be able to get land or farms, really. Most of them were farmers, uh, the, the vast majority of Japanese Americans in the West Coast. And um, some of them were successful farmers. They really worked hard in turning desert land into, into the farm fields we know in California, for example. And so there was a lot of jealousy about that. And so one of the sort of the uh, subtexts of this move to uh, imprison 120,000 Japanese Americans was to take their land. And so um, uh, they were given two weeks, many of them, to just pack up what you could put in a, in a, what you could carry. And you were going to be sent off to a points of no, unknown. And, and actually many thought that they were going to be killed. They had no idea what was going to happen or what was going to, where they were going to go. And so within that time, they had to just get rid of everything they had. They had to either sell them, people would come by and offer them pennies. And there are terrible, just, just heartbreaking stories of people who were for their for the their wedding china that they had were offered like a few cents. And there's one story of a woman who just picked up every one of her plates and broke them because it was just so, you know, you're gonna offer me a dime for this. And and many lost their um, their homes, their land, their, you know, the businesses that they had spent a lifetime building up. And so after the war, um, many came back to find that everything was gone. Mm -hmm. Some of them had good neighbors who actually protected their, um, their homes, their, their crops and, and gave it back to them, but most lost everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Shannon, uh, I want to use that as an opportunity to, to uh, bring you into the conversation. We know that each group represented here is targeted differently by white supremacy and that anti-Black racism exists in an old hateful universe all its own. You've reported on the red summer of 1919 when white mobs committed wholesale violence against African-Americans across the country. And in 1921, the horrific race massacre that occurred in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Greenwood, in Tulsa, Oklahoma's Greenwood District, known as Black Wall Street. And in the years before, during, and after those events, the destruction of other prosperous Black communities by white mobs. From your research, what motivated that violence? And were those attacks considered exceptional for their time? Um. They're certainly not exceptional. And I think um, that's one of the things when, it, when, when we honored what happened in Tulsa um, this year, it was so great to see so much attention towards what had happened in Tulsa. Um, but I think um, what my team and I really wanted to point out was that this had happened hundreds of times in various um, ways 
uh, throughout the country, not just to Black people, but to, as Monica knows, Mexican people, because I, I called her to ask about this, to, as Helen was talking about, Chinese people. Um, it was absolutely not exceptional. And I think I've been a journalist for about 10 years now, and one of the quotes that um, sticks out to me the most is from a historian named Kirsten Mullen, who wrote um, From Here to Equality with um, William Darity. She said that when you, the only reason that we, sometimes the only reason that we know that these affluent Black communities existed is because they were destroyed. Mm. And she's really talking about how um, this didn't just happen in Tulsa, this also happened in Ochoa, Florida, in Wilmington, in Detroit, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Um, what happens is black people after reconstruction, we all know, um, you don't need to read a history, reread a history book to know that we're given absolutely nothing and yet still continued to thrive, to own land, to farm, to create communities of their own. Um, we have people not just in Tulsa, but all over. If, um, Wilmington is really a, another smaller Tulsa where we have newspapers, black businesses. And the problem with that for white Americans is that they, they think it's okay for black people to exist separately. But when they start having the same kinds of levels of wealth um, and what they see e as even worse political power, that's when you start to see people pushing back. And that happens, you know, pretty much at the start of Reconstruction all the way through the 1920s and onwards. And that hatred really bubbles up when you start to see Black people voting. So in New Orleans and Louisiana, particularly, you see um, Black people just trying to exercise some sort of small rights to be a part of the reconstruction of their cities and of their states. These cities and towns, especially throughout the South, are kind of rebuilding themselves. And there's an opportunity to kind of um, create a, a new and better society. And in some ways, Black people were already involved in those things, especially in New Orleans. You see Black politicians and Black, and, and black people um, really at the forefront of their community. Um, but when they start to, to demand a vote, when they start to demand a say, when you start seeing Black people on um, in Louisiana, for example, in New Orleans, um, on local police forces, that's when you really start to see white people get angry. Um, there's a really great historian named Kate Masser who says, it's, it's one thing to, to, let, to allow Black people to be free. It's quite another thing to, to put them at your level. This was a country that, was a, that is a white country. That is what people thought for the majority of um, the 1800s and 1900s. And uh, let's face it, like it's still in large part today. And um, America was made for white people and everyone else is here at their behest. And I think... Um, you know, you you hear echoes of that and what Helen was talking about and Hasia was talking about. And um, when you start to see that country turn away from being predominantly white and being here for white people and being um, where everything is kind of laid out for the white race, that's when you see people pushing back. And um, unfortunately, those attacks like Tulsa just happened over and over and over again. And as you mentioned, they happened so often in 1919 that it was called Red Summer. But that, they continued well into the early 1900s. And we unfortunately only looked at riots up until um, about World War I, but I'm sure you, you'll see that this happens um, throughout the century. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, I wanna also uh, remind the audience that we welcome your questions uh, and we'll take them uh, uh, after a little bit more of this conversation. But please put your questions in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on Facebook. Uh, we would love to hear what you're thinking and would like to know. Monica, last year, uh, actually, let me just set this up a little bit to say that Monica and Dahlia, 
uh, I'd like to ask you two to both help bring us closer to the present day. Uh, Monica, last year the FBI reported that hate crimes against Latinos rose to an 11 year high, including the anti-Latino mass shooting in El Paso, Texas that left 23 people dead. The gunman in that case said his crimes were sparked by fears of, quote, a Hispanic invasion, unquote, and by fears of uh, ethnic and cultural replacement. Those murders coincided with political rhetoric that promoted that very narrative. In your book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, you reveal the lost history of state-sanctioned killings of Mexicans in Texas. How was the, ju how was the violence justified then and what can it tell us about anti-immigrant hysteria throughout the country today? Thank you. That's a that's a it's a hard question to to grapple with. Um, as many times as I've been asked, it you know there's a long history of anti-Mexican sentiment in the United States that that most people don't know about. You can trace it you know all the way back to the Texas Revolution um, and the U.S.-Mexico War when you had Anglo settlers to places with that are for now uh, called Texas, uh, advocated against uh, inclusion of Mexicans into the government, um, into society. People like Sam Houston, for example, referred to Mexicans as uh, an indolent race, uh, a, a referred to them as, as phlegm. Um, uh, John C. Calhoun was a vice president, um, a former vice president of the United States during the U.S.-Mexico War between 1846 and 1848, spoke out against uh, actually acquiring half of Mexico's territory at the end of the war because he didn't want to incorporate the Mexicans that lived in what would be the ceded territory. Um, he described the United States as a government for the white, the free white race, and actually uh, was was quite adamant, um, as were others. There were this, a series of debates throughout um, US history about the place of Mexicans. They were characterized as, um, as a mongrel race um, and as racially inferior, but also incapable, incapable of uh, participating in civilized democracy. And, and so what's at the heart of that is these remaining questions about the place of Mexicans in the United States, even in the case of, of Mexicans that were in, in territories uh, that were Mexico before they were the United States. And, and of course, these were uh, colonized territories. Uh, the period of racist violence that I look at in the early 20th century is a stark period of racial terror. It was a, a period of racist violence at the hands of vigilantes, of mobs, for example, that lynched uh, Mexican nationals and American citizens, but it was also a period of state-sanctioned racist violence. And so this was violence that was called for by governors, by state senators, by U.S. congressmen, um, who stoked fears of a threat of, of Mexicans that were just on the other side of the border that could come across the United States to, to murder um, and to pillage Anglo communities. Um, and what happened as a result is that anybody who looked Mexican was deemed a threat, was deemed suspicious, and they were, you would call today, racially profiled. And so this meant that people, regardless of their age, their class, their gender, or their citizenship, uh, were victims of, of racist violence. And it also meant that this was a, a, there was a widespread culture of impunity for vigilantes, but also for Texas Rangers um, to commit acts of violence, uh, to collude with mobs, um, to lynch people, um, to target land-owning Mexicans in South Texas, and also to target Mexicans that were politically active and politically engaged. And so violence was used as a tool to try to replace Mexicans from having any sort of cultural or economic or social influence in the region. Um, and it was used at the same time that you saw the development, uh, the passage of Jim Crow and Juan Crow style laws. And so the that racist rhetoric that, that criminalized Mexicans, that cast them as perpetually foreign um, and called for their brutal policing uh, what was 
also characterized the US-Mexico border as a dangerous place and as a place that needed to be militarized. And so you saw not only governors um, increase the numbers of Texas Rangers they sent down to the, to the border region, but you also saw that the US government uh, deployed hundreds of thousands of US troops down to the US-Mexico border before they were deployed to fight in World War I. So this rhetoric of Mexicans being dangerous, um, being a threat to civilization and to Anglo society, and also in need of violent policing is something that continued throughout the 20th century. But one of the contradictions is that at the same time that you had congressmen like Claude B. Hudspeth from West Texas saying things like you've got to shoot Mexicans when you see them, is that you also had um, Americans, Anglo-Americans actively recruiting Mexicans to come into the United States and to work and to, to fuel the railroad industry, um, especially in decades after Chinese exclusion. There was a shift from turning to, to Chinese labor on the railroads to needing Mexican labor on the yeah. railroads. And so there is a history of um, but this, uh, the, uh, on the one hand, criminalizing and racializing Mexicans as, as being un-American um, and as a threat to society, being undeserving of citizenship, but you also have a reliance on Mexican labor in agribusiness, especially um, in the Southwest. And so the United States has created past laws um, to help with the criminalization of Mexicans. The, the 1929 Undesirable, Undesirable Alien Act, for example, criminalized unauthorized entry into the United States. Um, and, and it has been shown by historians that it was seated in racist animus, that it was designed by nativists, and it was supported not only by eugenicists, again, who had this um, great anxiety about what uh, introducing Mexicans to uh, a, a white nation would do for the actual uh, uh, body politic, um, that it could threaten you know, the, the, the uh, superior white bloodlines in the nation, um, but it was also celebrated by, by white supremacists like the Ku Klux Klan. And so we, we have to, as a nation, we haven't fully confronted the history of white supremacy in our immigration policies, and we haven't fully thought about immigration as a racial justice issue. So, you know, if we think about the past the, the last administration and the, the rise that we saw in anti-Latinx and anti-immigrant hate crimes, uh, it's a reminder that, that for decades, politicians have been using the U.S.-Mexico border and using anti-Mexican and anti-immigrant rhetoric to fuel their political campaigns and to fuel um, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment. And so the, the consequences of this rhetoric has led to violence. It did a hundred years ago, and we are seeing it again today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monica. Dahlia, uh, at last week's town hall, we heard from Daryl Johnson, a former senior analyst for the Department of Homeland Security, who warned in 2009 about the growing threat of right-wing extremism. That warning cost him his job. Mm -hmm. Now, after the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, America's top law enforcement officials have testified that white extremists are the biggest domestic terror threat in the nation. But after years of divisive claims that Muslims are plotting against America and therefore they must be surveilled and banned, surveys have found that most Americans hold an unfavorable view of Islam. Please tell us why you think that is and the role played by the million dollar industry that feeds on Islamophobia. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I think your question is really important because Islamophobia and the industry behind it is a threat to every single American. And I think that's really the take home message I wanna leave our viewers with is that Muslims are 1% of the population. If Islamophobia only impacted Muslims, it might not be an issue for you. You may not care, it may not impact you and your family, but what I'm here to explain is that Islamophobia impacts the 100% of Americans who care about this country's future, care about freedom, care about safety. It's not just something that impacts Muslims. Why 
uh, why was why is there this this fear of Islam and Muslims? You know, I used to be of the opinion. I used to believe that it was a natural outcome of you know 9/11 or a natural outcome of um, perceptions that you know looking at violence carried out in the in the name of Islam and and folks looking at that and and being afraid of Muslims and that while it was um, maybe unfair to stereotype all Muslims because of the the actions of a, a tiny percentage um, it was understandable I could I could sort of sympathize with that but then I examined the data a little bit closely a little closer and I realized what I realizes that Islamophobia is not an organic, natural outcome of bad Muslims behaving badly. It, it is the outcome of a very deliberate manufacturing of hate against Muslims, um, where uh, terrorism in the name of Islam is simply instrumentalized in the service of hate uh, and it's not done, it's not a natural process. And I'll just explain what I mean by that. I, I examined uh, public opinion data carried out by the Pew um, you know, Research Institute. And what Pew found is that uh, public opinion, um, American public opinion uh, connecting Islam and violence changes, um, you know, throughout it changed and, and, uh, and kind of went up and down uh, over the past 20 years, except it, it, it changed in ways that I did not expect. So the percentage of Americans who connected, who, who, uh, believe, who said that they believe that Islam encourages violence more than other religions, in 2001, only a few months after 9-11, where we would expect that opinion to be the most negative, was a minority of Americans, about 22% of Democrats and 33% of Republicans connected Islam with violence more than other religions. And so, you know, that is understandable. We just had the worst terrorist attack on our soil just happen a few months before. Uh, so, Emotions were raw, understandably, and people were upset. And so we expect that number to go down with time as people gain a more sort of balanced and, and educated, um, well-informed understanding of, you know, of Islam and of Muslims and so forth. But what happened is exactly the opposite, that that percentage didn't go down as you would expect it to if it were organic and normal it actually started to spike up as time elapsed and it hit a spike in the drum up to the Iraq war. And so Islamophobia was used and weaponized to drum up consensus, to drum up consent among the public for the Iraq war. In one study, um, the majority of Americans believed there was a direct connection between Saddam Hussein and 9-11 on the eve of our invasion into Iraq in 2003, something that we all know is not true. But for more than 70% of the public to believe that, to be so disinformed about something as important as why the hell we're going to war is astounding. And that's one of the many ways that Islamophobia is a threat to every single American because it manipulates us into agreeing to something that we later all regret. I mean, the majority of Americans regret the Iraq war. Um, and we were all, you know, there was majority, we're all for it. At the time we went into war because of disinformation, because of Islamophobic disinformation. The other times that that number spikes is not after a terrorist attack, but during election cycles, especially among Republicans. And that started in um, the season that preceded 2008 elections, where, um, as you all remember, uh, President Obama was, quote, accused of being a Muslim, you know, as if it's a slur. 
and um, and that Islamophobic perception that Islam uh, encourages violence more than other religions started to spike among Republicans in 2007, again in 2012, and then it just skyrocketed in 2016. Today, um, the, the most recent poll was 2017, where more than 70% of Republicans now endorse this view that Islam endorses, uh, encourages violence more than other religions, compared to 33% in 2001, where it should have been the highest it's ever been, if it were an organic, natural um, re response to normal, to things happening on the ground. But it's not, it is a the product of political manipulation. And so why, why should we care about Islamophobia? Well, because it's a tool of political manipulation. It makes us less free. We are lied to, to get us to agree to things we would normally not agree to, like going to war. It gets, it, it, it's, a, it's a tool of uh, politicians getting our vote. And it's also, it makes us less safe because Islamophobic rhetoric it's so ironic that it's always framed as some kind of be, you know, pro-national security uh, posture. And it's quite the opposite. We have seen propaganda videos that terrorists use to recruit using direct clips from Republican primary debates in which uh, Islamophobic statements are made to show that America is hostile toward Muslims and Islam, and therefore should become a target. So no, Islamophobic rhetoric is not making us more safe. It's doing quite the opposite. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Uh, listen, everybody, um, I don't know about those of you who are elsewhere, but here in Brooklyn, which is where I am, there's a lot of traffic and it can get a little noisy. So if you hear traffic noise behind me, it's because I'm in Brooklyn and I'm proud of it. Um, I wanna switch gears now. Uh, uh, to strategic responses and victories. Uh, and thank you all so much for setting things up for us. Um, a while ago, a Native American leader named Diane Fraher told me that, quote, indigenous people have been experiencing racist terror and theft for hundreds of years, which means we have, hundred way we have hundreds of ways of dealing with it, unquote. Tonight, now that we've outlined the shape of this problem, let's talk about some ways of dealing with it. I'd like to ask specifically about uh, strategic responses and examples of empowerment that may take form small or large. Helen, you mentioned that the men who uh, killed Vincent Chin received a uh, basically a slap on the wrist and that that judgment um, created an unprecedented collective outcry. You were at the forefront of that activism can you tell us please about the organizing and community building that occurred in response to that sentence and the lessons it can provide for us today? Yeah, um, listening to all of the other speakers talk about just how white supremacy, supremacy is used to um, maintain control and domination and divide us and uh, disempower our communities is the only answer to that is to organize, organize, and organize. And that includes educating, educating within our communities and beyond. So when um, Vincent Chin was killed, we're talking about another economic crisis. That was, uh, it came after an oil embargo in the Middle East that led to the collapse of, of, of the auto industry because people couldn't afford to buy American dinosaurs but they were manipulated into you know, this hatred toward Asians. And for the Asian Americans living in Detroit, we were living under that cloud of fear. I mean, what happened to Vincent Chin was a feeling that every one of us knew it could have happened. It could happen to any one of us just walking down the street. And he was out for his bachelor party and his 400 wedding guests went to his funeral instead. And we all just knew that could have been our brother, our father, our cousin, any one of us. Um, but the other part of that is that communities get disempowered by that. They're, they're, they're afraid. People were afraid and we had, had to do intense 
um, meetings, constant community meetings to talk to people and say, we must respond to this. We must talk about injustice. We have to talk about Asians and racism toward Asians. And a lot of the re reaction we got from people were, were, if we speak up, are we going to just get more hatred directed to us? Um, Asian Americans are not included in the dialogue of race and racism in America. This is 1982 and it was all seen as a black white binary. And so we've not been part of that. If we join in that, are we going to be seen as part of the problem? Which of course feeds into the, the um, thinking that if you're silent, you can be safe. And so part of the response was to, to just, you know, have meetings, talk to people at the level that where they were at, what their fears were to address those, as well as outside of the Asian community to go and talk to, um, you know, the other, just other um, American communities. Detroit is an incredibly diverse uh, city, a largely majority black city at the time, but it is also home to the largest um, Arab American community in the uh, in North America and um, long history of union uh, activism, human rights work, civil rights. And so here we were a small community, um, not even together as Asian Americans, but just separate Asian ethnicities coming together. And the response outside was, well, who are these people? What are you talking about? Where did you Asians come from? And remember, we were always seen as the enemy invader. So you know, what are you doing here? And to um, African-Americans, there was like, what? well, you're talking about civil rights. Um, you know, are you just out of nowhere having never supported us in our civil rights movement, which wasn't true, but because our communities are invisible, that's how we were perceived. You know, what? where are you coming from on this? Um, Asian-Americans, you're mostly immigrant. Do you speak English? Are you Americans? Um, and should immigrants be protected by federal civil rights law? These were all questions that came up. So organizing and, and amplifying our voices by coming together and people being courageous to stand up. And first and foremost, the, the mother of Vincent Chin, Lily Chin, to stand up and through her grief to talk about no other mother should go through this. And um, for Asian Americans, Lily Chin really stood up in a way similar to the mother of Emmett Till. And so within the Asian community during this time now of terrible anti-Asian hatred, um, every conversation in the Asian American community also references the Vincent Chin case and how people stood up and how Vincent Chin's mother stood up and that this is an example of what we as a community need to do. Um, I do think, you know, when we talk about the impact of white supremacy that, and the awareness suddenly of white nationalists that, oh my God, Americans getting so like uh, less white, it's darker, darker, what's going to happen? A lot of what we're seeing today is a reaction to the, um, you know, the growth of communities of color largely because of the Immigration Act of, in, in 1960, of 1965 came out of the civil rights movement and changed the white dominant immigration policies. And so there's an awareness of that. And I think for the last four or so decades, there's been an intensive um, manipulation, propaganda to, to vilify our various communities of color, including immigrant communities, to hide our history, what I called MIH, and keep us apart. And not only that, to keep us, um, uh, divided and fighting each other. And I think for Asian Americans, we really have to, um, you know, uh, really work in the organizing around solidarity with other communities of color, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with black and brown uh, BIPOC people, and um, talk about Islamophobia, the largest uh, Islamic country, uh, the, the, the country with the largest number of Muslims in the world is in Asia, in Indonesia. And so all of these things come together, but because, because of this intensive, um, you know, 
effort and and really um, really I consider it to be propaganda disinformation you know um, it has really disempowered our communities and so it's only about organizing and and working hard to not just talk about allyship but to talk about unity and how if our communities just listening to all of our panelists the parallels and similarities all coming from the theme that you talk about greed keeping control keeping um, the profits keeping communities powerless if we brought our communities together and if we could fight and stand together you know history and demographics we will overcome um, and this period we're going through of, of, of great division is, is part of that calculation to try to, to keep us from doing that. Thank you, Helen. I, I want to pick up on your comments about uh, collective action and organizing uh, and turn now to Hasia. Hasia, uh, in 1915, a Jewish factory superintendent named Leo Frank, who had been wrongfully co convicted of the murder of a young girl was kidnapped and lynched by an armed mob in Georgia. Was that event a turning point? What did the murder of Leo Frank mean for Jewish Americans? And what steps did they take in response to combat injustice? Okay, so it's a great question. So on the one hand, it was obviously shocking and it is the one lynching of a Jew in American history, which I think is really very important in terms of understanding the impact of Jews being white and therefore having a level of protection uh, in this country that they didn't have in the countries they had left, where the white, not white, was not the uh, uh, issue. Um, certainly out of the Leo Frank case, on the one hand comes the Anti-Defamation League okay, as an organization, but it wasn't uh, um, the first. And so uh, earlier in the 20th century, the founding of the American Jewish Committee uh, was um, probably the first really significant uh, step of an elite group of American Jews who said, we have to find a way to defend ourselves, okay? And uh, we cannot let uh, this country, which grants us full citizenship, which uh, heretofore allows us in without any problem, uh, we can't allow it to slip and to become like those places uh, where our people are, des which our people are desperate uh, uh, to leave. And so they engaged in, I would say, every possible strategy that they could think of, try to prove that all the uh, lies being told, all the statements being told about them were lies, not truth. So there's use words. They tried by doing good deeds to show, yes, we are good Americans. We're not greedy, selfish, uh, uh, power mongers, but we are uh, like all Americans. We're uh, hardworking and law abiding. Um, they uh, were constantly involved with reaching out to uh, uh, Christians of uh, goodwill, goodwill and asking them to join in uh, defending them. That is have these uh, non-Jews speak for the Jews. So the Jews uh, in offering their arguments are not sounding like they're self-serving and being defensive. They appeal to the state, okay? they appeal to the US government and to state and city governments where they believe they have been either defamed or where um, they would like the US government to intervene for Jews in distress elsewhere in the world uh, where they believe Jews are being discriminated against as uh, Jews. And I think uh, one of the issues that has really consumed so much of my historical scholarship is the way that many Jews, again, starting with uh, those uh, uh, men, because it was a men's organization involved in the American Jewish Committee, uh, found ways uh, really from that date on to link their cause with the cause particularly of African-Americans. And uh, to say that... Uh, the kind of society in which uh, uh, the uh, rampant, violent uh, uh, oppression of other people uh, is allowed is not going to be a good place for us either. And uh, the uh, solidarity, which went from these elite uh, men of the American Jewish Committee and then 
uh, uh, eventually became associated with uh, Jewish socialists and with uh, the immigrant the immigrant Jewish socialists um, uh, who represent, uh, in a sense, a very different political different political um, ideology than the American Jewish Committee uh, uh, um, uh, elites um, were constantly thinking about how linking up with others would make America the kind of place where they could be safe. And uh, they understood their numbers were so small. Okay, and we heard before that uh, Muslims are 1% of the population. So Jews at the, at the height were about 4%, 4 to 5%. So we're talking about tiny drop in uh, the American, um, a tiny drop in, 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 a, in a Christian uh, ocean that they could not do anything on their own that would be really effective but it was how to link up with others, okay? It wasn't uh, always a happy uh, uh, effort. It had its ups and downs, its uh, bumps, uh, but uh, it was for um, the vast part of the 20th century, a strategy uh, that uh, uh, was pursued uh, uh, relentlessly. And um, so it was all of these uh, different kinds of uh, strategies with, again, the Leo Frank, I think, is a real shocking uh, moment in time uh, to jolt uh, uh, this group that really wanted to be quiet. It wanted to be silent and uh, it wanted to uh, keep its nose, as it were, to the grindstone and just work and um, try to fit in. They realized they couldn't just fit in. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Hasia. Dahlia, um, the U.S. Census Bureau omitted identity categories for people of Middle Eastern or Northern African descent from the 2020 U.S. Census, instead classifying, quote, any person having origins in Europe, the Middle East, or North America, or, or North Africa, unquote, as white. Can you tell us how empowerment is achieved by institutions that provide objective research and education about American Muslims and the smaller victories of individuals who embrace their cultural identity and speak out against hate. So the, uh, the, the definition of people that look like me as white is um, very interesting. I don't treat, I, I don't get treated as, uh, as, I, as if I'm, I'm white on the census, but not in the airport. So I'll just explain it that way. It's, uh, it's quite interesting and, um, and strange that, uh, and, and they even put on the census like specifically Egypt, you know, so I couldn't even like get out of it because that's where I'm from uh, originally. That's where I was born and immigrated to the United States when I was very young. But it does underscore the importance of doing objective research, which is what we do at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Uh, because this kind of research um, does not, you know, isn't done by, by our government. By doing objective research on communities, we are able to replace fear with facts. We're able to educate ourselves and the public on who, you know, our community really is, what we believe, what we contribute, what our challenges are. And it paints an accurate picture so that decisions and, and dialogue um, regarding the community, regarding the Muslim community or Muslim communities in America is well-informed. And when this topic of Muslims is so prevalent in our national discourse and yet so devoid of actual data, research, facts, it hurts our democracy because if we're not well-informed, we, we can't function as a democracy. And so that's what we're trying to do is um, inject facts into what is sometimes a very um, misinformed, infor you know, misinformed conversation. And one that is interestingly missing the very people that are being discussed. Uh, I, I thought it was really interesting. I saw this one statistic where media coverage of the Muslim ban literally with the word Muslim in the in the name of what we're talking about, um, featured uh, Muslims as as sort of commentators two percent of the time, and I was just like blown away by that number. 
Um, so it's not only that information is inaccurate, but that the voices of Muslims are um, totally missing in even issues that pertain to them specifically. And so that's what we're trying to address by providing rigorous academic research that folks can use uh, and, um, and push forward. And, and the impact of that is everyone's better off because we, have, uh, we are able to have media that is more accurate and inclusive and actually informs the public. We're able to have policymakers that make decisions based on facts, not assumptions or stereotypes. And, and we're able to educate our children, all of our children, in, um, in who America is and what America looks like in its totality. And I think we're all better off that way. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Monica, um, on this topic of, of uh, empowerment and, and victories, you've written about preserving memories as a strategy of resistance against historical inaccuracies and social amnesia. Please tell us what that has meant for Latino communities in decades past and the relevance of that strategy to the world today. Thank you. The hard truth is that the, the work of communities uh, to commemorate and remember uh, the lives of their loved ones that, that were victims of uh, racist violence in the early 20th century um, is, is a reflection on the failure of history institutions, of museums, of archives, but also of the field of history to really truthfully report on um, this, this period of, of racist violence along the US-Mexico border in the early 20th century. Um, for too long, actually, the histories of racist violence against Mexicans has been celebrated as progress. It has been celebrated as an example of Americans, of the United States strength to police its borders. Um, and what it has meant is that the victims of racist violence, people that were denied due process, murdered, lynched, um, that they were criminalized both by the state, in, in police records, but also by the media. Um, but families and witnesses to this violence preserved the names of their loved ones. In the midst of violence and racial terror, they did things like call for prosecutions. Um, they filed, uh, in some cases, Mexican nationals filed uh, claims against the United States um, to hold them accountable for the denial of justice of their loved ones. They did simple things in some cases like insisting that a death certificate be issued to acknowledge the loss of their loved ones. And, and so what that reminds us of, of is the daily practice of some individuals to refuse the criminalization, to refuse the dehumanization of their loved ones. And in spite of, of people in positions of power to disavow their loss, they preserved those memories and preserved archives so that historians 100 years later could write not only about those injustices, but about people who were agents um, for, for change, people who worked to pass anti-lynching legislation, um, people like JT Canales, who was a state representative who filed an investigation against the Texas Rangers in 1919. So that, would, that left a congressional record of those state crimes and abuses of power. And so people uh, you know, tend to say, we can't judge people of the past by our current moral standards. Um, that's unfair. That's just the way things were. But when we turn and recover the history of people who were fighting for social justice 100 years ago, it reminds us that that's not the way things were. That's the way things were made by people mm. in power, by politicians, and by people living in everyday society that didn't fight against injustice. There were people at 100 years ago that were calling for democracy, that were calling for protections of people against violence, and they were calling for institutional reforms to policing. And so we can learn from those inspiring strategies, um, also just the just the, the practice of remembering somebody's name and refusing for them to be anonymous in the archive um, is, is something that has been profoundly inspiring for me to see that from generation to generation, people preserve these histories. They also preserve the names of people who committed these crimes with the hope that, that even generations later, there would finally be a truthful accounting of what took place. Um, what we can also take away from studying history is, um, is these moments of, of where we uh, have forgotten 
that these histories of racist violence intersected, excuse me, they collided in different historical moments. And we tend to think about anti-Black violence, anti-Mexican violence, anti-Asian violence um, as separate, but they intersected. And there were moments of opportunity for coalition building that actually could potentially have led to greater social justice gains earlier on. And by studying some of those missed opportunities, as well as those examples of, of cooperation, um, we can also be inspired uh, today for, for building together coalitions for a better future. I like to say that we Texans don't need myths, that, that everyday people fighting for social justice in Texas history is inspiring enough. And so people actually just need access to that truthful accounting of history. Monica, thank you so much for that. You remind me that one of the things I'd like to ask you all about uh, once we complete this is uh, if you would be able to provide uh, any suggested reading uh, for our viewers and, and uh, everybody watching this now or in the future. Uh, Shannon, you recently reported on African-American progress during the Reconstruction era including the career of Oscar James Dunn, the first Black lieutenant governor in Louisiana. That history of Black achievement has been largely forgotten or distorted. In producing your report, what did you learn about that period that would provide guidance or inspiration to us today? Yeah, they, I want to, I think this will largely echo what Monica is saying, and I um, have talked to Monica about for some stories that I worked on. Um, Oscar Dunn was um, born a slave, became, uh, worked his way up after um, being freed. He um, really helped uh, white people um, employ black people after they were um, freed. Um, he worked his way up to um, become part of the city government. And he was Lieutenant Governor during Reconstruction, um, the, during the Reconstruction period. Um, he breaks that mold. He breaks what the um, kind of the falsehood that I learned in school in history class, which is that black people were not ready to lead, to take charge, to manage themselves during Reconstruction. And that's why Black people got the vote and then lost it. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, so uh, very liberal place. You, and, but and yet I didn't learn much of the history that I learned um, just by talking to people like Monica and reading um, the stories of Oscar James Dunn. Um, that came from another young um, history professor um, named Brian K. Mitchell. Um, history professors are doing immense work. Um, they have been, and they're doing it more. I think we see a lot of it because a lot of these stories have come out in entertainment and, to, and in movies. Um, but we need to do a better job of taking time to not just understand what's happening now. News is very good at reporting what happened five seconds ago. Um, but we need to take a little bit more time to understand what happened 50 years ago that made what just happened five seconds ago possible. Um, and historians are being helped out a lot by local news media who very often are taking um, anniversaries of things like Tulsa um, and retelling those histories. Um, the Equal Justice Initiative is helping communities set up markers um, in communities where there were lynchings. Um, but we need a lot more history lesson. I wish we could take a break from the pandemic and all go back to history class. Um, and we could probably add a few other lessons in that class too, like how to talk to people when you're angry. Uh, but since we might not get that break, um, I would just encourage people to read as much history as you can. And when you see news organizations writing about history and writing about things that really enliven and enlighten your understanding, click on them, share them, because the power that the audience has, the power that everyone out there has to, um, to have real influence over 
journalism and over what we cover is immense. It's immense. Thank you, Shannon. Um, we're winding down now. And those of you watching, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be happy to share them with our uh, esteemed panelists. Um, I have two sets of questions and we don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna ask if we could do two sets of lightning rounds and maybe cheat the difference a little bit and see what happens because I would love to pivot from discussing the past and the present to talk about the future. So uh, your, your most succinct response is if that is possible given what I am about to ask you. Uh, Monica, given your scholarship and work as an educator at the University of Texas at Austin and Hasia, your work as an educator and scholarship at NYU, can you both tell us in a sentence or so, how do things look on campus? Uh, how are students responding to what you're teaching, to what's going on in, that wor in the world? And what does their response suggest to you about the future? Uh, uh, Monica, would you start, please? You know, I can speak both from uh, being a professor at University of Texas at Austin and, and before joining UT, I was a professor at Brown. And I can say that, you know, students from across disciplines are coming and taking classes with historians of race. They are also taking classes in ethnic studies where they are learning these intersectional histories of race and ethnicity in the United States. And they are making connections between what they see on the news today and what they see as the injustices of the past. And they are really committed to learning from history to build a better future. I mean, so it, it means that I have students in the School of Communications who are gonna be journalists who feel like they need to know the history of the border if they can contribute to a more accurate representation of immigration policy and debates today. I also have students that are coming to my classes that wanna be doctors who say, the demographics in the state of Texas and across the country are changing. I need to be able to be informed um, so that I can be the best doctor or medical practitioner that I can be. And so I think the future is, is being informed by the past. They're anxious to learn these histories. And when they see parallels um, or if they see historical patterns repeating, um, it, it emboldens them to to want to make change. And so they they keep me going for sure. Great, thank you. Hasia, what you're I'm saying? Offer, yeah, I'm gonna offer a very different perspective. I find that um, the uh, interest of students in the humanities, which is essentially what we're talking about, okay, um, is, um, from my perspective at a uh, kind of all time low, and that the uh, tremendous concern with uh, uh, majoring in subjects that will uh, purportedly get students jobs and which will be entrees to uh, uh, high paying professions uh, pushes the humanities uh, in um, uh, lower and lower on the agenda. Those who show up in the class, yes, I would agree with Monica. They're really interested in making those connections between uh, past and uh, present and are very much engaged with the kinds of issues, let's say, sparked by Black Lives Matter uh, and by the whole vast public discussion about uh, uh, the uh, challenge to democracy uh, in um, our society, one that I, a serious uh, threat. But on the other hand, their numbers, the numbers uh, we see, and it's not just my impression, but uh, the, the statistics that come out of the School of Arts and um, uh, Sciences about the humanities are, from my perspective, a very troubling um, uh, uh, kind of portent for the future because I think it is through subjects like the humanities that students will develop that kind of broad understanding that my fate, my place in the world is connected to everybody else's and I can't know about myself without knowing about everyone else. Thank you, Hasia. Uh, Dahlia, uh, I'm gonna ask you also for a, a, a brief response if possible. Uh, the last time I looked at your TED talk, what is it like to be a Muslim in America? It had generated almost 8 million views. What have you learned about that experience? Uh, and what does it suggest for you about the thirst for information and about forces stronger than hate? 
What it teaches me is that um, the vast majority of people around the world are interested in making connections rather than condemning others. Uh, there's almost a myth that the bigots are the majority. They're not. They, they, they have really loud voices. They might have more access to power, but they are not the majority. They are a vocal um, fringe, actually. And uh, the success of, of my TED Talk and, and others shows that people are really interested. And I've gotten emails and messages from around the world um, of people just saying, I connected with what you said and I don't share your faith or I don't share your background, but I understood what you meant. And, uh, and, and that human connection is what gives me, truly gives me hope. Uh, I think it's, it's what we have to count on as we move forward in a very complex world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shannon, the History Refocus series that you produce for CNN is described as, quote, stories from America's past that you should have heard about but probably didn't, unquote. What are you learning from public response to those stories? And what do you feel is the media's responsibility to engage in that type of storytelling? Um, yeah, that, that um, series is made by a team of producers and writers. Um, and uh, I think we've learned that our audience is just as interested in those stories as they are in the um, all the stuff that, as I mentioned, happened five seconds ago. Um, and in some ways, it's surprised editors, I think, that people are so interested in history. Um, and uh, I've seen that kind of reporting being done by, uh, by a number of other outlets. I know ABC had a great um, Black History TV series that, was, that happened um, a few months ago. Um, but I think what we need is, is an ongoing effort. You know, when, when we have moments like Black Lives Matter and we see this great swell of interest, um, that needs to be sustained. I think a lot of us are afraid that we're going to lose that momentum, that when something happens and we start paying attention to Chinese American history, when we start paying attention to Muslim history, that that moment fades. Um, and I, I, I hope we don't see that um, happening soon. But um, I would say again that what we also need to do a little bit more, uh, we, what, what we also need to work on a little bit more is um, tying where we are today when it comes to inequality, when it comes to the wage gap, when it comes to um, inequity, to all of the things that happened before. Um, if I could recommend a book, From Here to Equality, um, this book ties these um, events that we've been talking about, things like um, Tulsa, um, things like um, not getting the 40 acres and a mule, it ties all of those things together forward to the wage gap that we see between um, African Americans and white Americans today. And we need to be better at making those ties. And I think we need to be better at talking to historians, talking to journalists, um, and as Monica said, like kind of bridging those gaps together, which I think is one of the things that your panel's trying to do, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Helen, I'm going to ask you to close us out here. Um, I understand uh, that you and some significant producing partners are developing a scripted limited series about Vincent Chin. What do you want that project to accomplish and what makes today the right time for it? Well, thank you for that question. Um, as a writer, I'm in a whole new world about trying to see in, a, in another medium. How do you tell a story about a tragedy that pulled people together across all walks of life uh, to make change that benefits everybody? And that is what um, I think every one of us has been talking about in different ways about how that kind of story has been um, just not told to, you know, whether that's deliberately suppression, <laughs> you know, um, selective censorship, keeping the stories of how people came together. And, and that's the story that, um, 
that I'm working on in terms of, of uh, trying to reach new audiences, even Asian Americans who have not heard about, um, you know, the, the hate killing of Vincent Chin and how the different Asian ethnicities and other communities came together to stand for racial justice and, uh, you know, liberty and justice for all the promise of America. So um, we, you know, um, have so much to do. I mean, just listening to everybody, just there's so much to unlearn about what we have been, the poison that we have all been consuming about each other. And then to try to reclaim the real history that's there, that includes the history of solidarity between our communities. I mean, you began your question uh, to me about 1882 and the Chinese Exclusion Act and Frederick Douglass, you know, the prominent African leader and intellectual of that time, African-American leader and intellectual of that time, stood up and said the Chinese Exclusion Act is wrong. And every Black American and every American should oppose it. I mean, we have so many stories like that of, of Asian communities standing up for um, the Freedom Riders or uh, Asian and Filipino and Black and, and Mexican uh, farm workers coming together. I mean, there are just so many stories that we don't know. And so this is just one that I'm working on, but, uh, but just listening to everybody on the panel, there are so many stories that have have to be told because that's what's going to pull us together as a country to stand up for democracy and um, and the idea that we are all as human beings deserving of full humanity and, and human dignity. So that's what that's about. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to try to cheat this a little bit more since there's no one here poking in my ribs except on the phone saying we have to wrap up. Uh, the final lightning round question, if you can answer in just a couple of words, will not be mine, but one from out in the um, uh, ether, as it were. What are you excited or optimistic about right now? Uh, I want to call on each of you in turn. Monica, anything that has you especially excited or optimistic right now? Uh, the collaborations. I mean, being able to work with Shannon and and is one example of a journalist just saying, you know, I, I learned about this history that you wrote and I want to learn more and share it with my audience. It, it's I think that the plot, the potential for collaboration is just profound. Yeah. Shannon, if I can pass it over to you, if that's fair. Oh, I would echo that. Um, I would also say, um, OK, I know I look really young, but um, I'm going to say young people. Uh, their energy um, is just overwhelming. Um, and I think uh, they have proved that they have are, are going to do some great good. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Hasia, what has you excited oh. or optimistic right now? Young people also. I think that they will create a new world. Uh, and I think that the events of January 6th have shaken enough people that uh, uh, programs comp uh, on media, in uh, people coming together and talking to each other uh, is going to be a, uh, a kind of turning point in terms of seeing each other as allies. Uh, in a common struggle to keep uh, democracy alive. Got it. Thank you. Helen, in just a few words, something you're excited about. This whole this. period of, of pandemic has just ripped open and exposed the um, inequities and, and the, the, the pathologies of our society and that there are so many voices coming forward today to say, this can't be sustained. We have to change this. And that gives me hope. I think there are many voices out there, not just here, but globally. And um, and that's what's going to bring change in the future. Great. Dahlia, closing, you have closing words. I think what gives me hope is the growing awareness of our shared struggle. These kinds of discussions weren't happening 20 years ago even. People were struggling their own struggle in, you know, somewhat in, in a silo. And now we understand that our freedom um, is all linked and we can finally build the alliances we need to overcome uh, white supremacy. I wanna thank all of you. On behalf of everyone at the WNET group, thank you again for joining us tonight. 
and everyone watching, thank you. Uh, please learn more about Exploring Hate Presents and our other great programming from that initiative at pbs.org slash exploring hate. And be sure to join us next Thursday for our final town hall in this series, Disrupting Deceit, Exposing and Opposing Disinformation Campaigns. It will be a knockout. Thank you again to you panelists. Uh, just incredible and such an honor to gather with you. Uh, good night to everybody and hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.